She also attended Ohio State University. Her the. first, the Ohio State, the. yes. <laughs> the Ohio State, yes. I've got a friend in med school there, and it's the. <laughs> Her first job out of college was a, as a sheep specialist for West Virginia Department of Ag. Susan now conducts the Western Maryland pasture-based meat goat performance test. That's a mouthful. Yes, it is. But it's now in its 10th year. So, for the past several years, she has been comparing the performance, health, and carcass characteristics, characteristics of pen-fed versus pasture-raised meat goats. She is also the author of several web pages uh, pertaining to small ruminants. And Susan herself raises cacao and sheep on her small farm in Clear Spring, Maryland. Thank you. That was a mouthful. So yeah, I got my professional start in West Virginia. I always tell people I went to five years of college, but I got my education in West Virginia. Because the most important thing about uh, education is to then work in the real world and know how to balance. I value both. I don't value just raising animals on experience and gut feeling. I don't value raising animals just out of a book. I believe in raising animals or producing agricultural products with a balance of both. We don't have a very big group here, so you're required to take five handout seats. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but because we don't have a very big group, we can be real informal. I mean, yeah, I got a set of slides. I actually got a bunch of slides. We don't have to cover them all. We don't have to follow that. Whatever you want to do, but I'm going to start out going through it. Do you have a copy of the slides? You need a magnifying glass to read yeah. them? <laughs> well, just think, if I had put two slides on the page and made 50 copies, how many trees I'd have killed? Job security for the work. That's true. And people have to work off. So, what I do and said is I'm very internet oriented. Everything I do, I put on the internet. I have many web pages, I have many social media sites. On the last page in the last slide, you actually need a magnifying glass to read it, but there is the URL of this presentation. I put all my presentations on SlideShare, and you can view it or download it. And you will also be on YouTube? Yes, I will be a star on YouTube. <laughs> no, I'll be on YouTube. It will just be like your medical and your online Right. When we do webinars, we also record them. In fact, one of the references I have listed, uh, we just did a pasture management for small ruminants web series. We did five meetings that all, all are recorded. They, a couple of them still need edited, and then uh, four of them still need, we also will convert them to YouTube videos. It would be very similar. Okay, so here's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about nutrient, nutrient requirements, intake, <coughs> synchronizing forage and animal production, supplementation, evaluating the nutritional program, and then, like I said, the last page is some suggested references. Feel free to stop me at any time. I, she gave a pretty good introduction. Um, it's important. The work that I do with the Goats at the Research Center is very relevant to what I'm going to be talking about uh, here today. Um, a lot of us share some of that data and share some of those experiences. I give a lot of talks on nutrition. Um, the foundation of raising livestock. Because we're a grazing conference, I'm going to try to orient it more towards obviously pasture production. Because it's a little bit different. You know, raising livestock, there are free range and grazing situations versus those that are taking their feet out of the feeder and production. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't think one is better than the other. I think there's lots of ways to raise livestock. And the production system, you can have either in both. I see either in both. Actually, for what it's worth, I'm more interested in the pasture system. Okay. That's fine. Okay. But you're at a grazing club. I'm just kidding. I'm the first one. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <here. laughs> and my sheep production system is semi intensive. I don't have enough pasture to graze the land. Extensively, not to mention, I, I want them to, I don't want to, don't want to. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we, you know, but the goats is, we do a lot of work with pasture. So, we're going to start with the basics on nutrition. You guys know that animals don't require specific feedstuffs any more than I need to eat broccoli. 
I have the light box. But I, it's not what we feed in that's the requirement. The requirement box has specific feeds, specific forages, specific nutrients. So energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins. You can see water. Water is the most important nutrient. I believe there was a, is or was a presentation in this conference completely devoted to water. Because in, all right, go to this presentation. From a nutritional standpoint, nothing's more important than water. And unlike cattle, sheep and goats, they're dainty. They are not going to eat the dirty water that cattle will. So water is extremely important. All right, so we're going to start with energy. How many of you have ever gotten a picture where they're eating and pooping at the same time? I'm so proud of that picture. That's the two ends I work with. Okay, uh, energy is what we, we and they require in the highest amount. It's most often the limiting nutrient. This is particularly true on pasture-based operations. Energy is the most limiting nutrient. They primarily get it from carbohydrates, fats in the diet, but they also get it from protein in the diet. Um, when they have excess fat in the diet, they store it in the body. As, I mean, excess energy, they store it as fat. We're all familiar with that. We do that too. But what's important to understand is the difference between goats, hair sheep, and other livestock. A goat fattens from the inside out. As a goat gets fatter, it deposits fat around the organs. By the time that goat has fat on its back, fat goes to the loin. That is one little chunky thing. Hair sheep, with the exception of Dorper, which aren't really a hair sheep, are similar between, or halfway between goats and, and wool sheep in terms of fat and in terms of cattle, pigs, and most sheep, when they get fat, they deposit that fat on their bones, on their backbone, on their ribs, on their loin edge, the places we feel the body's weakness. The moral of that story is do not let goats get as fat as sheep or cattle. Do not let their sheep get as fat as the traditional wool breed as they're that much fat in the body. If, you're, if you have a really fat hair sheep or goat, cut them open and then okay, I'll show you how fat it is. Oh, I went a little too fast. So that's similar to how a deer does it. Probably. What's the closest cousin to a deer? Yes, yes. Right. In lots of ways. Lots of ways. And um, also the same difference between men and women. We put more fat, we have more fat in the than men do. And if you look at the sheep breeds, and you think of goats in general, it seems the internal fat goes with different functions. Because our breed of sheep that are superior to the we call them sheep. They deposit more fat internally. And as a species, the goats are pretty well known for their different functions. Okay, from an animal nutrition standpoint, there's a lot of different ways to express energy. PDN, whole digestible nutrients, is the most common. It's the crudest measurement, it's just the percentage of the diet. I feed one pound of hay, it's 50% PDN, so they get 50% energy. Um, digestible energy, as the food goes through the system, there are losses. So metabolizable energy, that's when the feces are lost, or I'm sorry, digestible, metabolizable, uh, urine. Uh, most modern ration balancing programs are using metabolizable energy. Uh, the dairy industry uh, will use a net energy system, they partition the energy. First, the animal has to be maintained, then it has energy for growth and lactation, and that P stands for production. The last one is the digestible organic matter. Now, I didn't really hear of that one until this past year when we tested the feces of our goats to determine their diet quality. They didn't report PDN like a forage testing report. They reported uh, digestible organic matter, which is analogous to PDN in some ways. Okay, a lot of consequences to over or in, improper feeding of energy. You know, and we and both of these are quite common. Underfeeding energy is going to have potentially all sorts of effects on productivity, fertility, growth rate, milk production, loss of body condition and reserves. They're going to have a higher critical temperature. What that means is back when we were cold and it might have been snowy. An animal that doesn't have any back fat, any body fat, can't handle those temperatures, and it's going to need supplemental feed at a higher temperature than one that has uh, more body fat. Coats being each, all other things about the coat being equal. Goats are the most fragile in the cold because they have 
again, they don't have a sack cover. Uh, their hides not like cattle. And they're really most susceptible to cold temperatures and other inclement weather. Um, reduce, reduce resistance to disease. And the number one disease affecting small rivers, especially on pasture, is going to be parasites. So nutrition has a big effect on parasites. <coughs> uh, the risk of pregnancy toxemia, one of the most common diseases in, in sheep uh, and to some extent goats, is caused by an inadequate intake of energy during the last trimester. Um, when the animal consumes less energy, the percent of protein in the ration must be higher to compensate for that. Of course, too much energy is just as bad. First of all, it's wasteful economically. Um, Overconditioned animals have impaired reproduction. I'm going to define overconditioned as a body condition score of four and a half or above. We tend to score sheep on, and goats on a one through five system. We use half scores. Cattle one through nine, they use full scores. So one is emaciated and five is overconditioned. So what I would call underfeeding nutrition would be two, what I would call obese or, or being too overconditioned would be four and a half and above. Okay? Uh, pregnant females or, or fat females are more prone to pregnancy toxemia. We think that doesn't make sense. But in reality, if she doesn't get enough energy in late pregnancy, she's going to break down the fat into toxic tissue in the body. She's also more likely to have problems giving birth. She's more likely to prolapse her vagina, <coughs> especially hair sheep. Again, there's only so much room in here. So if it's full of fat babies and cords, what's the easiest thing to get rid of? Put your, your, your vagina. And then once you push the lambs out, you can get your vagina back. Okay, if I look at the market animals, um, once an animal reaches its optimal finish, its feed efficiency, how it, how it utilizes feed uh, for calories to put on gain is greatly reduced. And nobody really wants fat. Certainly there are differences in the amount of fat that people want, but nobody wants obese ones. Okay, switch the protein. Really amino acids is what they need. Uh, we started in smaller amounts. What's important about protein is it's a more expensive component of the ration, whether you're buying feed or even planting forages. Um, the amounts are more important than the quality because the rumen makes protein. Okay? Excess protein is not stored in the body. It's uh, broken down and used as energy. But it's more expensive than energy. So again, the cost is more. Some excess protein may be beneficial for parasites because the barbical worm is a blood sucker. So the animal loses blood and protein. So research has shown that if we increase protein, we can reduce those fecal egg counts. We can reduce, increase the tolerance. Just like energy, it expresses in different ways. Crude, crude I guess I'll have to show you do like <coughs> the, up, this, the pointer is very close to its case. Okay. So crude protein, again, is the crudest measurement of how most sheep rations are balanced. Digestible protein, again, after the feces. Uh, metabolizable protein after the urine while we're accounted for. Again, a modern nutrition program would now use metabolizable protein. These other two proteins we're going to talk about in a minute are protein that's degraded in rumen and protein that is not. Okay, so basically protein is the nitrogen content There's two types of, um, two sources of protein for a ruminant, true or natural protein, which they get out of their normal feed, and non-protein nitrogen, an example of that would be urea. Within the proteins in our feed, they all contain a certain percentage that's degraded in the rumen. In most feeds, the majority of the protein is degraded in the rumen. Uh, the nitrogen is converted to ammonia to microbial protein. And then there's a percent that's going to escape or bypass the rumen. Hence the name, escape and bypass protein. Uh, it's going to be absorbed lower in the system. Down in the, it's going to reach the abomasum. It's going to be absorbed in the small intestine. This graphic just shows you kind of how a whole crude pr protein thing breaks down. Okay, bypass protein. Um, animals will be most productive if they have a mix of those two different types of protein. For high producing animals, it's recommended that the bypass protein be about 25 to 35. Our forages don't tend to be that much less, um, but for optimal productivity or for high producing animals, you might want to provide a source of bypass protein. Um, we have uh, research has shown that bypass protein can increase productivity. Most of the 
work is done with dairy cattle. Um, but there has been some work with sheep. If you increase the protein in the late gestation diet, those last four to six weeks, you need to bypass protein source and we lower the fecal egg count. Sheep and goats suffer a temporary loss of immunity when they give birth. It's called the carry partridge egg rise. Their fecal egg counts shoot up. If they're lambing or chitting on pasture, have access to pasture, they're depositing all those eggs on the pasture. While the sheep mom may not be clinically sick, she becomes a major source of infection for those lambs and kids as they graze in late spring and summer. So we want to do something to counter that increase. One way to counter it is with protein supplementation, particularly bypass protein. Some of the better, some of the sources of bypass protein, soybean meal, our typical source of protein, is uh, not considered a good source. Uh, most of the most of our standard feeds and forages will, will fit into that category. Uh, Cottonseed meal, alfalfa, particular grains, a little bit higher. The best sources of bypass protein come from animal products. Well, you guys know with uh, mad cow disease and, and meat and bone meal, those things aren't available anymore with the exception of fish meal. And that's the highest source of bypass protein that we have available. Corn gluten meal, a lot of times when heat is applied, uh, to the feeding, to the processing, the bypass protein goes up. A good example if I just look at raw soybean, roasted soybean have a higher bypass protein than just uncooked soybeans. Okay, what happens when we improperly feed protein to livestock? Well, if we don't give them enough protein, it's not something we, we go up and say, you're not getting enough protein. The effects are usually subclinical. And I tell you, I would believe that this condition is relatively rare. We focus so much on protein when it came to living capacity and energy. But where it would come into play if it, if it really was restricted, again, it would affect the same things with lack of energy deficit. Reproduction, growth rate, corn and hook growth, milk production, fiber production, resistance to parasites, especially, or resistance to disease, especially parasites. Again, blood protein. Okay? Also, the relationship between protein and energy in the diet has a lot to do with how efficient uh, the rumen functions and the health of the Well, what about if we do the other, which I think we're far more guilty of? Too much protein. Well, one, it's an expensive and inefficient source of energy. You know, price soybean meal versus corn. Think of growing orchard grass versus alfalfa. Okay? You can get pickle rod in the males. High protein diet, and I think this is particularly going to occur in a fed diet. Pizzle rod. Anybody know what pizzle rod is? It is what it sounds like. It's not your air captain lab, but it's an infected sheep and semen. And he ain't going to want to breed with a pizzle rod. I don't know if people can get it. It's just a thought. <laughs> 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 The, the other thing too much protein in the diet can cause is it can cause metabolic harm because that excess nitrogen is being converted to ammonia and urea. It's going to reduce performance because energy is required to break that protein down. Um, research has shown excess protein to be detrimental to dairy cattle, particularly reproduction, a little bit of work with beef cattle. <coughs> Maybe not a big, as big a concern with sheep because they tend to have a higher blood urea nitrogen, that BUN, nothing is ever known about goats. Okay? The other thing is excess nitrogen, if it's excreted in the manure, that becomes an environmental concern. Uh, nitrogen is either a pollution or a resource, depending on where it's at. I learned, I learned right, a new definition for uh, pollution is just a resource out of place. It makes perfect sense. We might have, in, in our state of Maryland, we might have too much uh, nutrients from a manure uh, sample on the low acre and pull all the chicken blood from out of your account. So it just depends where the resource is. So potentially having more nitrogen is good if, if you need nitrogen, but usually it's considered a harmful. Like on that corn gluten you were talking about, it was good. What, what kind of grain should they have been? Well, the first, the, first, the first thing you have to do is make sure it's protein. Then if you were aiming for like a 30%, you'd have to look at your, all your feed sources. All your feed sources. Because corn, soybean meal, hay, all of them have some. They just vary. They just vary. So the parasite thing you wouldn't be saying though. You wouldn't have to be saying. 
Next is the micronutrients. These are just nutrients required in smaller amounts, grams, ounces, parts per million, international use. Minerals, we got macro minerals, which are required in larger amounts than the micronutrients. So our major minerals of interest are calcium, phosphorus, and salt, sodium and chloride. We balance rations for calcium and phosphorus because they're more important, they're required in larger quantities. Okay? Other uh, macros are potassium, magnesium, and sulfur. The rest of them are trace minerals, about nine of them. Not less important, just required in lower amounts. Because we know we focus a lot on selenium, we focus a lot on copper. If we go to the vitamins, we've got two kinds, fat-soluble and water-soluble. The fat-soluble, A, D, E, and K. A is in green forage. B is from sunlight. E is in forages and stuff, but the one most likely to use supplements, K is synthesized in the water. A lot of mineral mixes will contain A, D, and E. Uh, the water soluble vitamins, the B vitamins, are, think, are synthesized in the rumen. That's why we often give the B complex to try to stimulate appetite. In a, in a ruminant, vitamin C is also synthesized, so we don't need to give them any more. Um, this slide up here has got a lot of words on it. It's just basically what can happen if we have excesses in minerals or vitamins, what can happen if we have deficiencies, and what can happen when the balance is being proper. And these things don't just occur in a feeding situation, they certainly occur in a pasture situation. Um, I've only ever seen one lamb, animal with crickets, or one farm that has a problem with crickets. Calcium and phosphorus are very important to bone formation. And, uh, in, uh, inadequate calcium can cause milk fever uh, in use, pregnant use. Copper, she, people focus on toxicity, but we can have deficiencies. The classic symptom is sway back. It also affects the wool, it can make the wool stringy, it can affect color, it can affect the hair coat. It can have a lot of impact. It's important to immunity. Um, iodine, goiter, an enlargement of the thyroid gland. They talk a lot about iodine supplementation in, in the Midwest. Uh, well, I guess they must be more deficient in iodine in the soil and forages. Magnesium deficiency, grass peccy, doesn't tend to be as common in sheep and goats as it is in cattle, but it's always a potential. Salt, the primary uh, problem here is it affects their feed and water consumption, and less intake of feed and water is going to ripple throughout all the production cycle. Uh, selenium and vitamin E, primarily white muscle disease, can be one or both of those uh, in deficient and it's related to a lot of other things going on. The deficiency of thiamine, not actually caused by a deficiency, but actually because something's interfering with the animal's ability to use thiamine, can cause polio. Uh, zinc, a lot of different things zinc can affect. It's definitely involved in hoof growth. Uh, when somebody's sheep are picking the wool off, one of the first things I ask is what kind of nutrition they have, what kind of mineral nutrition. Uh, it can affect skin in goats. It can have a lot of rippling effects. You can also get milk fever by having too much calcium in the late pregnancy diet. Um, copper, toxicity, unfortunately sheep are very prone to that. Uh, they require copper in their diet, but there's a very narrow margin between what they need and what becomes excess. It's stored in the liver, and if it reaches a certain level, they're gonna have a hemolytic trace. Okay, uh, selenium toxicosis, we primarily get that when we over ingest selenium or use the wrong selenium product. Uh, imbalances, and we'll talk a little bit about these on the next slide, but copper, molybdenum, and sulfur, and calcium and phosphorus. Okay, calcium and phosphorus, an imbalance of those minerals can cause urinary tacky-like kidney stones, especially in males, especially in the uh, uh, neutered male, especially when uh, that neutering is saturating and then at a very young age. Okay, it's recommended that ration I should say rations, not ratio. Never go below one to one. Ideally, it should be about two to one, again, especially for growing males or males in general. Uh, when you look at the nutrient requirements of ewes and does, it, it doesn't tend to be as high as two to one because phosphorus is pretty important to, to reproduction. Uh, cobalt needed to make vitamin B12, so if there's a cobalt deficiency, they wouldn't need to synthesize B12. Copper, molybdenum, and sulfur. If someone were to ask me what the max amount of copper sheep can have in their diet, I can't answer that because it depends on the amount of these other minerals. Molybdenum forms an insoluble complex with copper, thereby making the copper unabsorbable. Too much molybdenum can lead to a copper deficiency. Not enough can lead to a, will make lower levels of copper toxic in the animal. 
Sulfur then binds with the lignin. So you can see how they all interact. If you look at the nutrient requirements of sheep with small ruminants, you will not find that toxic level. It's going to be small. And it's going to look at ratio. Goats, we're not even sure. Uh, nitrogen and sulfur, uh, that relationship is important. Energy and protein relationship is important, especially for human health and efficient utilization of nutrients. Okay, next we're going to go into the nutrient requirements. Again, we don't require feed, we require nutrients. Okay? A lot of things affect the nutrient requirements. Species, genetic size, body shape, sex, weight, and stage of our consumption. Have some graphs that I'm going to use to demonstrate some of these differences. You're going to find out on graph happy. I like making pretty graphs. And hopefully, my idea is hopefully they do a good job of visually showing you the differences. The two at the bottom are pretty important disease and environment. Because while their needs are based on the things above, disease and environment can change those requirements. In most cases, increase those requirements. When they determine nutrient requirements for sheep, goats, cattle, that animal is a metabolism trait in a building. They're kind of being pampered. They're not getting rain on, it's not windy, it's not cold. They don't have parasites. So if an animal is parasitized, its protein requirements are going to be higher, its energy requirements are going to be higher. If you house your animals outside of the winter, then its nutrient requirements are going to be higher. Um, if the animals have to walk more, the ones that are really active foragers, they can have higher nutrient requirements than those that are housed. Okay, so here's my graph. How do nutrient requirements change by species and by genetics? Because most people, not everybody, but most people that are interested or have sheep are also interested or have goats. So I think the comparison is important. So the first graph is for a 132 pound female. I love my 132 pounds. Now that's a pretty small sheep and a pretty big Angora goat. That's the only way I could compare them. The highest nutritional requirements is for the Angora goat. Although you know what's interesting about Angora goat? From a nutritional standpoint, her first priority is fiber production. For a sheep, for meat, for dairy goats, their first priority is production, reproduction. Okay? So when I say that fiber goat has the highest requirements, I mean not only being going towards maintenance, the other ones are maintaining themselves, but she's also growing some fiber. Within the other goat type, the dairy goat, meat goat are the same size, the dairy goat has higher requirements, and of the same size, the sheep has the lowest. As a percentage of body weight, sheep require less feed than goats, and <coughs> goats require less feed than dairy goats. Okay? On the other side, we got lambs and kids, which were impossible to compare completely equally. But these are 66 pounders. Uh, the Angora goat <coughs> is also growing fiber. It needs the most feed for the least amount of gain, but again, it's growing fiber. And kid mow here is a lot more valuable than the adult mow here. As I compare the other types of goats, the boar, the local, and the dairy, uh, the dairy kid, big frame dairy goat, requires more nutrition to maintain itself. Uh, the boar goat requires more nutrition for what we might call a local or indigenous breed, say a Spanish goat or a Biasonic goat or a scrub goat or a brush goat. The lamb requires the most, but in this case, uh, he's gaining twice as much. So it, they really couldn't make an accurate comparison. Okay, size and weight, we've got a hundred and we've got different nutrient requirements for does and ewes. Obviously, as they increase in weight, they have a higher nutritional requirement. If you are feeding animals, the lesson of this is, if you don't raise sap rounds and salt, together in the same pen. If you don't raise angoras and saunas together in the same pen, they have different nutritional requirements. On pasture, where you're not putting fe a feed bucket in front of them, you're not weighing that feed, understand that that bigger animal has to consume a lot more feed than that smaller animal. And some, in some cases, those bigger animals, 198 pound ewe, can be much harder to maintain her on pasture. Again, 198 pound Suffolk versus 110 pound South Carolina. So even though you're not putting feed in front of them, understand they have to eat that much more to meet their nutritional requirements. They vary, uh, nutritional requirements vary by stage of production. My example is going to be a 132 pound non-dairy doe, so a meat goat doe, raising twins. My ewe is going to be 176 pound raising twins. Okay? Nutrient requirements increase throughout the production cycle. As we breed her, she gets pregnant, she moves into late pregnancy, and then she moves into lactation. Increases. One of the things interesting about goats, and I'm not sure I believe this data, 
is that the highest energy requirement for the dough is late gestation. If I had a dairy dough up there, believe me, that final bar would shoot up. In the case of the sheep, they increase the rack, with the highest requirement being during lactation. Okay? Protein. Same thing for protein, same pattern. Uh, in goats, late gestation and lactation, pretty similar protein requirements. In the ewe, uh, protein requirements increase substantially after during lactation. Again, I don't care how, whether you're feeding them in confinement or grazing, the needs are the same. And you need to address them either through a feed bucket, a hay, a hay feeder, or a pasture. Mineral requirements, again, we always balance the calcium and phosphorus, especially for reproducing females. Uh, not that high during maintenance and breeding, but once they get pregnant, those requirements go up substantially. Difference between sheep and goats. In goats, they stay the same throughout gestation. In sheep, there's a significant increase in late gestation, which probably explains why most cases the milk feeder in sheep are during late pregnancy. A lot of cases in goats are in lactation. But that's the difference between the two. It affects how you feed. Again, if you're feeding hay and grain, you approach it one way. If you're out on pasture, you need to look at it a different way. The requirements are the same. Okay, here let's look at the level of production. Whether she has single twins or triplets. There's no data on quads, no data on twin couples. Okay? But you do it tell you going to get quads. More babies, more nutrition. It's your energy requirement. The biggest difference is in the one baby versus multiples. One baby versus multiples. That's where the substantial increase comes from. And the other one separates. Once she's pregnant, one of those separators is substantial. And that's not always possible to find somebody who can do that. Uh, after she's, this is for gestation, but in lactation, you can have production when you can separate them. What do you do on pasture? Same thing. You can separate single use, single bearing females mm -hmm. from multiple bearing and make sure that that is pasture and quality quantity multiple. There's always a way to do it on pasture too. Sometimes it just takes, takes a little more proof of safety. Um, now let's look at how performance, again, level production affects nutrient requirements. First example is for a 44 pound impact or uh, buckwheat. No gain, he needs about 7 tenths a pound of TDN. And what does that mean, 7 tenths of a pound? If you were feeding a hay diet, divide that by half. Okay, that's what that means. If you were feeding forage or, or free grazing, all right, 0.7, you're going to need to divide that maybe by 0.75, higher level of energy. But then you need to account for the higher level of moisture, and then you figure out actually how much you need to consume. If we're putting it in a feeder, we can use the way. I don't pasture we can't, so at least that would give you an idea. But switch over. From, but basically, you want to perform better, grow better, eat eat to intake more energy. And it might not be possible to get those higher rates of gain on strictly a pasture diet. Lamb, same thing. Better performance requires more intake of energy. It may not be possible on a pasture diet. So maximum performance isn't always the most profitable, nor always the goal. Okay, intake is a huge part of nutrition, particularly for pasture-based operations. I know exactly what my needs are feeding. I know how much I put out there. I know how much they're eating. Okay? If I'm in a grazing situation like this goby of here eating chicory, I don't know. But yet, intake I know is really important. And remember, they require amounts of nutrients, not percentages. A, a, a feed could be 2% protein, but if the animal ate enough of it, you could get what it needs. Okay, you probably wouldn't eat enough of it. The other thing to keep in mind is the requirements are based on dry milk. So one pound. We did some forage testing, I'll show you a little bit later, where uh, orchard grass was about 40% dry matter and the uh, others were about 20. So a bite of the orchard grass was equal to one bite of the other stuff just from the original moisture. Okay. Feedstuffs vary considerably in what they have. Fresh growing, really good quality vegetative forages are very high in moisture compared to more mature pastures, compared to most of the harvested feed. Intake can be a definitely limiting factor in pasture system, particularly for high producing, and by high producing I mean lactating females and growing kids and lambs. 
A lot of things affect intake, what it tastes like, uh, their foraging behavior, the quality of it, other things in there, chemical characteristics of the feed. Uh, condensed tannins, when they're in a feed, we consider them a secondary compound. Cattle don't like them. It goes from sheep tolerated, and they also have an inhibitory effect on parasites. Temperature has an effect, supplementation, they all affect the intake. We want to increase the intake in almost all circumstances, unless you've got some fat girls. And if we want to limit intake for somebody that's too fat, usually we restrict access to that um, forage. I never believe in free choice forage. Because I think every being on earth will I'm going to limit it. In, in that female, not for a yin. So that female is underneath. Next thing I want to do, and again, I'm draft happy, and I hope these drafts make sense and help make the point, is synchronizing forage and animal production. In the sheep and goats, you have really almost two enterprises. You have the breeding herd or breeding flock. These are the females that, that, that give birth and raise the lambs. Once they've been weaned, uh, that enterprise is over, and we need to be concerned about how do we get these kids and lambs, how do we run them out to market. In some cases, I'm not going to separate them, but at some point, the nutrition of lambs and kids is going to supersede the nutrition of females, and in some cases, I may sell them weaned. All right, I'm going to look at three scenarios. Lambing and kidding in the winter, lambing and kidding in the spring, and lambing and kidding in the fall. The graph that you see, the red is the nutrient requirements of that 176 pound annual food. The graph in orange is the requirements of that 132 pound uh, doe with twins. Requirements based on where she is in her production cycle, based on lambing and kidding in December, I'm sorry, in January, weaning a couple months later. If I match up the growth pattern of our school season graphs, orchard graphs, best feed, Kentucky food graphs, Timothy, what does this show me? It shows me that during the time I need the most feed, I don't have it. Okay? When I'm when she's in gestation, that second part of growth in the fall is going to be nice. Okay? So what am I going to do with that fact? Uh, obviously, the feed can come out of a bucket or out of the barn, and that's not always bad. But it depends on everybody's situation and everybody's <coughs> I wouldn't get to that. Okay. Winter. We're in the winter. <laughs> so I can do things with my extend my grazing feed. The picture there is best view. It could be stockpile fence feed, but also some annual grass clippers and things like the plant. In this case, if I had these used on stockpile fence view, I still need to supplement, but at least it would provide a good bit of the energy that she needs. Okay. Now we look to lamp and kids for in January. We have a couple months later. Perfect. Especially if I land in kids maybe in February. When they wean, we've got that flush of spring pasture. Okay? So I could, or I could sell them at Easter, but with that pasture, I could market them probably before July 1, before the markets typically go down, before parasites become a significant problem. On the other hand, if I want to aim for the muscle market, which is going to start being uh, here. I can kind of put them in a holding pattern. Okay. Uh-oh. All right. I'm going to keep talking, but I didn't remember hitting escape. But you know what happened? The battery fell out. Did the battery fall out? No. That's not. It's all right. He hit escape. But I have the same graphs for spring. I know a lot of people are interested in One of the things I like to do would be to um, uh, make sure I have my pastures have legumes. Legumes, for the most part, are legumes have the same pattern as the but better summer growth and you have to be the My forage option would be legumes, or do what we do at our research center, put a warm season draft in there. 
warm season grass, warm season lichen. We plant wolf full millet, we use four sources of warm season grass. Okay, that's not helpful. Okay, the last scenario is landing shooting in the fall, which is very much promoted in West Virginia for a lot of uh, very good advantages. So let's see how it matches up with the forage. Um, that fall, that fall spurt of growth is going to help to a certain extent during, during lactation, but we're going to need something else. Again, these are some of the same options. Uh, better quality summer pastures when extended grazing. Stop composting would be ideal for maintaining dry use. If I switch over and look at the lambs and kids, um, good forage to support them when they're lactating on their dam, uh, but nothing kind of after that. So, sell them on weaning, put them on feed, hold them on forage, sell them at Easter, sell them at Christmas, those are some of your different options. Not going to have a parasite problem. Oh, there's a If you wanted to keep them longer, again, you got to address that summer. In this case, not the summer, but the winter grazing. Uh, the ones in the back are going to be little. Okay, when should you supplement? Well, the whole key with supplementation is to understand you just don't give them feed. Because again, no one requires a certain type of feed or food. What nutrients do you want? And then you supplement that nutrient. Okay? Typically, energy supplementation is very helpful on our um, high quality vegetative pastures. Okay? Particularly, again, I'm going to say for high producing animals, lactating females and lamb, growing lambs and kids. Uh, protein supplementation, and I don't think there's many situations in, in this area where we need it, but where it would be really mature pastures, uh, warm season pastures, a perennial warm season, uh, but sometimes protein supplementation. The whole point of supplementation is that it's the added production you get needs to cover the cost. The cost is going to be the cost of the supplement, the cost of getting the supplement, and the cost of providing the supplement. This is our buck test. Last year we began supplementing them with soy mold halfway through the test. Who should you supplement and why? Uh, Use and does. It might be a situation we want to provide condition for. That's what flushing is aimed at. Supplementing in the beginning, early, before the breeding season starts, and in the early part of the breeding season helps with population rates and their survival, which could increase lamb and kidding rates. Late gestation and early lactation, I'm going to say in particular for high producing uh, lactating females. A ewe with turplets is equivalent to a high producing dairy. A ewe with twins is equivalent to an average producing dairy. Think of that through a nutritional requirement. Uh, lambs and kids, you want to improve growth rates, improve parasite resistance, get them finished for market. Some genetic types of, of, of animals, breeds and within breeds, they simply can't eat enough to get a finish on. And we want to finish these animals. They're not ready for market when they wait a certain amount. They're ready for market when they have a finish line. And I don't mean that to say fat, but they need to have a finish line. Um, I might want to hit a certain market, and that might be specific supplemental feed. I might want to get my females developed so that I can breed them as, as uh, seven-month-old females. I might not be able to do that just on a forage diet, so I might want to do that. Breeding that female when she's seven months of age pay big dividends. Uh, we sometimes we use supplements as carriers. I want to make sure they use the intake of animals. I want to get a toxicity status rule and antibiotics, say in late pregnancy, help with abortion. MGA is one method to induce out of season breeding. We need a way to get it to them. Uh, we want to try some natural type products that can have an effect on worms. Uh, nematode tract and fungus, not yet on the market, but you feed that through the animals. Got to have a way to get it into them. You feed it through them. It doesn't affect the parasites inside, it affects egg hatching and the development of larvae on pasture. Um, Cerise Elexabizatella, not readily available yet, but they can help uh, with controlling parasites as well. If you don't want to, if you don't want to, if you can't plant it and graze it, uh, pellets are an alternative. Obviously during drought or even the weather, sometimes it's best to pass the resources. Um, supplemental feeding tends to take three forms. Uh, the ideal for most pasture-based operations is supplementation doesn't affect intake of food. That's the ideal situation. In fact, I don't know what, uh, these, cat, these cattle they tend to make a recommendation not to exceed, certainly not 1%, it may even be less than 1% of their body weight before they will stop substituting. So at least a supplement instead of three things of forage. In some cases, that might be your goal. 
to stretch that path for you. In some cases it's not your fault. You want to maximize that force. So it just depends. And in some cases it complements. It increases the animal's intake of, of low quality uh, biomass and even high quality. That energy supplementation, supplementation is going to improve the utilization of those nutrients. Um, types of supplements, salt is usually a minimum recommendation. In fact, as a popular um, sheep veterinarian, they're telling producers that all they need to do is supplement salt to grazing animals. Um, mineral mixes are a general recommendation for grazing animals. Um, nutritional tubs and blocks like these lambs are eating, uh, they're, they're uh, made at, some of them are high energy, some of them are uh, high protein, uh, some of them might be higher mineral. They're great products. The only thing I'll say is they're the costiest way to get used to the animal. You have to trade off the cost of the fact that they make it for me to take a tub out there versus feeding them every every day or two. Uh, hay is common as a supplement. Um, it help, it kind of slow dry hay is going to slow down that high quality forage going through the gut. It's going to firm up the stools. I can tell you as a professional fecal collector, the consistency of the food is right along with the moisture of the forage. And it's no fun collecting samples when they are raised fresh, vegetated pasture. Okay? Grain is going to be usually the most economical source of supplementation. Corn, barley, it's going to be the cheapest. Cerise de Espadiza pellets, I already mentioned those. Not really readily available yet, but maybe an aid for parasite control on pasture. And then high fiber feeds, which to me are ideal for grazing ruminants, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. Um, we call them fibrous byproduct feeds. They're a byproduct of processing um, different types of crops. Uh, here's the list of them. Uh, they are permissible under USDA grass fed standards. You can feed any, of these, any amount of these that you want and still qualify as 100% grass-fed lamb or goat or milk or wool. Uh, the one I want to focus on is soybean mold. As you can see, that's the one that has the best nutritional profile from a nutritional standpoint. Uh, all byproduct feeds do vary in the nutrient composition, so you want to test it to know for sure. The roughage feeds tend to be low in starch, whereas grains are high in starch. They utilize different room and bug, so they're a better complement to soil. In fact, they've shown in cattle that uh, soybean hulls, while they might only be 70% PDN, and corn might be 88%, they replace each other one more. Right? Not necessarily on a cost basis, but on a nutrient basis. Okay? Mineral supplementation, again, a general recommendation. Um, why do we do it? How many of you take a vitamin in, in the morning? I take a dog. Uh, why do we do it? <coughs> just in case. It's just in case. It's insurance. So whether or not you want to just throw salt out there, or actually put out a good mineral, I guess it depends on your tolerance for risk. But because situations are different, mineral contents are different, soils are different, forages are different, animals are different, there's no one-size-fits-all mineral. Most of us feed a one-size-fits-all mineral. Really is none, and you really could get more specific if you did some testing of, uh, of soils, pastures, animals, tissues. I had some data come back on several lands of mine that shows that my farm is marginally deficient in copper and marginally high in So that information is important to you. You need to make sure you use species specific mineral mixes, especially when we're talking about sheep, but even goats should not get a sheep mineral or a cattle mineral or a multi. If you commingle sheep and goats, you got to favor the sheep because of the risk of copper toxicity. You can use bowls to, to goats to make up for that. Uh, you want to feed loose mineral mixes, not blocks. Uh, consumption will be better. Uh, you want to keep them dry. You don't want the minerals to run out. What happens when they run out? They eat it all, and then end up in the water. Um, you want to make sure all animals can get minerals, especially goats can be quite territorial and mean to each other. Uh, we'll have about 100 goats and we'll spread three mineral feeders out in the central window. Okay, if I'm feeding in confinement and I'm weighing out feed, it's pretty easy to know if I'm meeting the nutritional requirements of my animals. So I know what they're eating. With a product pasture based system, it's harder because I don't know what the intake is. Okay? But I can 
figure some out on my forage, and I can get an idea of the quality, I can get an idea, I can look at the animal and get an idea of stuff too. I can sample the feces to see what kind of quality of forage is. So there's two types of sampling you can do. Testing the forage, uh, doing a forage sample. You want to do it, be, um, it's going to tell you what they're likely to eat. Not necessarily what they eat, but what they're likely to eat. To increase the probability of it being accurate, you want to watch what they eat. You want to tear it off at the same part they graze. You want to take that sample when they first have access to the pasture. Um, you want to go over the whole pasture, mix the sample, need about a gallon. Ship, take, send it to the lab. It can be frozen before you send it. Uh, feces, we're going to collect that after they've been grazing for 30 to 60 years. We want to know what they ate. You need about a cork size. You need a full sample from about 10% of the flock or herd. And uh, we keep this one full and we take your mail that way. Okay, these are some of the forage test results we've had from our Minkyo test the last several years. Uh, the first three, of course, are this year. Um, you can see that we had put some pretty nutritional forages out there for them. Very, uh, very high in protein, 20, 21%. That orchard grass was actually after it had been mowed. When the goats first came in, they, they went on the cool season grasses. They didn't graze it into the paddocks, but it had been mowed. You can see this protein was substantially less. Uh, its CDN was substantially less, but its dry matter was substantially higher. So theoretically, if they ate the same amount of bites as the orchard grass is a good quality, they get the same amount of nutrients. And from what we know about animals, when the fiber content goes up, the consumption goes down, how it goes down. So we wouldn't necessarily expect that to happen. Although, ironically, I couldn't get them off the orchard grass. We had planted the sun hemp and dwarf pill millet. It was just new. And I had to lock them out of the orchard grass. Once they started the other ones, they, uh, they ate it well. Uh, one year we decided to test some weeds. Uh, not particularly how to weed, we purposely planted that. It's a pretty good nutrition. Look at that lamb's quarter. And then on the far right hand is the relative feed value compared to mid bloom alfalfa hay. We were offering some pretty high quality feed with the exception of that orchard grass. Okay, sampling the poop. We did that for the first time this year. Um, pretty much the, uh, the cool season grass paddocks, three of them, and three warm seeds. And again, you can see. They consumed a pretty high protein diet. Um, but they did consume a very high energy diet. That domestic, domestic, digestive organic matter is analogous to PDA. I don't necessarily think the values are as high, but to me the values are pretty low. And then when I compare the energy to the protein, they like that to be up over four for cattle. You can see this pretty low. What this tells us is they're deficient in energy. Body condition scoring would have backed up the same conclusion. And that brings me to the last thing. We can look at the forages. We can do a forage test to find out the quality of the forage that we're offering. We can do a, we can just calculate, estimate yield. We can collect the feces from the animals and see what quality diet they're eating. Again, nowhere did we get the insect. So we got to rely on the animal. How is the animal's general health? How is it performing? Rate of gain. Things like that. Body condition scoring is the most basic thing to do to evaluate our nutritional program. Regardless of how we raise livestock, but of particular importance to pasture-based production systems. It allows us to monitor the nutrition and the health. Can't do it without looking, without touching them. Typically, we do it over the backbone and ribs. We go back over the loin edge. You need to touch every one of them. Body condition scoring is relative. Dairy goats are, are thinner than meat goats. Goats are thinner than sheep. Here, sheep shouldn't be as bad as wool sheep. It's a relative score. It just needs to be consistent. One is an extremely thin, emaciated animal with no reserve. I've never called an animal a one, though I think we do have one. Five is obese. I've never seen a five because I always think it's always possible to get fatter. Generally speaking, just like the four, four and a half is one. Fat. You want our animals to be between two and a half and four. We want to have certain production goals. What is your body condition at the time of breeding, the time of lambing, the time of weaning? Use body condition scoring to determine market readiness. Use it to help us decide whether to deworm. But in this case, use it to monitor our nutrition program. Recognize some animals are always fat and some are always thin. Look for the majority of them. If too many of them are thin, then some, they need something. These were the resources I talked about. Again, 
can be a magnifying glass to probably read them. But if you download or go to that, uh, you get your magnifying glass out and you go to that uh, website at the bottom. Or you can just go to sheepandgoat.com and do a little exploring and you'll see your later find it. And it's time to eat. And you think that if you ever said rat that? I have it on my own farm and I have it with the research. though we got to be a little bit more careful about bacteria and mold and so sheep and goats and all that stuff. Really anything that's more potential is happening in the sheep and And a lot of it's maybe done less because of the flock compared to the smaller. Like I can't eat anything now that it's like that. Of course I'm also trying to follow the example of the rest and then square it. I don't have a fork. This is the fork. This is the fork. And I don't see it on the ground. Uh, no, I'm saying I used to. I used to, but I found it very uh, long of labor. And I found a problem with the fork. And I can only have that fork. But there's nothing wrong with it. Like I said, it's just my feet are just designed for. I have learned in my own little flock over the years that it's worth spending extra money. Square layer for two reasons. There's no weight, and what do I buy from? And I'm getting older, and I'm not just playing straight in the barn. Like but there's all sorts of options that work. About gelatin and caking and fusing on some of these guys. Um, we st no, Matt, he was asking about caking and pelleting. All of those things are options. The only thing to always keep in mind that it will ruin it, they need some long for it in the diet. You think about the soy hole that I was talking about. Um, they're not a long fork. So while they can replace for it and die, they're really a long fork. And then when you get to that point, all I say is economics, economics, economics. I do not feed soy hulls much at home because they are more expensive, considerably more expensive than barley. So the cost of me providing an energy supplement that is significantly lower is greater than it is soy hulls. We're going to feed soy hulls at the research center because I feel it fits the philosophy of our pasture based. 